Grace and peace to you from Lord our God, God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome uh, to Daniel chapter 7, second half. Last time we were in the first half of Daniel, uh, chapter 7, verses 1 to 14, which describes the vision that um, Daniel had. In the second half, from verses 15 to what, 28, I think it is, um, we have an interpretation of the vision. Now, let's remind ourselves of the vision to begin with. We, the vision has four animals, four beasts, rather uh, terrifying and terrorizing a type beast. You have a winged lion, and then you have um, a bear, who is, has three ribs in his mouth, like been gnawing on that, been gnawing on somebody, right? And then you have a leopard who is fast, a uh, winged leopard, actually, I think if I remember right. And then we have a beast that is more terrifying than the other three, but is not identified as any particular animal, just that it's more destructive, that it's more um, aggressive, we might say, in some ways. In particular, uh, the little horn that grows out of the beast's head is particularly arrogant and blasphemous and uh, seeks to undo uh, a God's agenda. Right? That was the first half of the vision. The second half of the vision, which starts in verse 9, goes to verse 14, is this vision of the thrones in, in heaven. We presume they're in heaven because it's about the Ancient of Days. It's where the Ancient of Days sits on a throne and where the Ancient of Days um, is like um, on a fiery chariot kind of thing. And alongside the Ancient of Days comes one like the Son of Man, one who is a, a human being, but a human being who rides on a cloud. And riding on a cloud is a divine thing. You know, it's, a, it's, it's something you expect God to do. So this is, that, that's a unique sort of picture to have this son of man riding on a cloud approaching the Ancient of Days. So my picture is that the son of man is ascending to the throne room, approaching the Ancient of Days, approaching whom we would call from a Christian context, the father. So the son is approaching the father, you might say, uh, and receives from the father a kingdom. Now, in where the Father is, is uh, it's a courtroom scene. There are thrones. These thrones are not just royal thrones. They are also judgment thrones. And the books are open. They're judgment books. So the picture in that second half of Daniel's vision is of the Son of Man entering into the throne room, courtroom, space uh, to receive authority and power. And the result of it is going to be judgment. It's going to be um, um, an undoing of the beast, a destruction of the beast. Right. So the, God's going to judge the beast. And that's the picture we have in the first half. Now we want to take a look at the second half. And in the second half, verses 15 and following, Daniel doesn't understand this vision. He's terrified by it. It's disturbing to him, but he doesn't understand it. So, in verse 15, let's read verses 15 to 28. I think it'd be good for us to get this in our mind. I, Daniel, was troubled by all I had seen, and my visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. He explained it like this to me. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others and so terrifying. It had devoured and crushed its victims with iron teeth and bronze claws, trampling their remains beneath its feet. 
I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast's head and the little horn that came up afterward and destroyed three of the other horns. This horn had seemed greater than the others, and it had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. As I watched, this horn was waging war against God's holy people and was defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days, the Most High, came and judged in favor of his holy people. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. Then he said to me, This fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise different from the other ten who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. But then the court will pass judgment and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever and all rulers will serve and obey him. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts. And my face was pale with fear. But I kept these things to myself. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Ooh, that's an interesting text. I think the, the big picture of it is fairly clear, seems to me. The big picture is, is kind of summarized right at the beginning. In verses 17 and 18, we kind of kind of get the, um, the, the abstract for the rest of what he's going to talk about, right? So you get this little summary statement in verses 17 and 18. These four beasts represent four kingdoms that will come from the earth. They're empires. They're earthly empires. They're human governments. But in the end, ultimately, finally, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. That's, that's the two main points. The first point is there's going to be a series of empires. And the other point is going to be don't be threatened by these empires because ultimately the people of the Most High, the holy ones of God, will receive a kingdom and they will reign forever and ever. All right? Those are the two kind of clear points. Now, what makes it difficult is, who are we talking about? Who are these beasts? And that's when we get into some differences of opinion. Right? And the second thing is, okay, when does this kingdom come? When will this kingdom be received? And there's a lot of differences of opinion there. So even though we get the summary in verses 17 and 18, and it's a clear kind of message, the human governments will fail. They will not conquer the people of God. They will not reign forever. They, will, they have an end. But the kingdom of God has no end. And the people of God will inherit the kingdom of God. Those two things are clear. But what's unclear is who, what are these kingdoms and when will we receive the kingdom? Those are the two questions that are problematic. And there are a whole continuum of views that have different answers to those questions. So I am not going to pretend that I got this figured out. I, I I don't want to, I don't think that I have it figured out. I've got questions about every view. And I think I understand why 
people will take view this view as opposed to that one. And I can appreciate how they get there and understand it. But I'm not convinced by any of them, really. Not not with but not where I could say, oh, I'm gonna go with this one. This is the white one. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is walk you through kind of these different views, but always remembering the two main points, right? The human governments are going to terrify the earth. They're going to attack the people of God. The human governments are driven by uh, interest other than the kingdom of God. They have their own interests, their own agenda. And that agenda is going to run roughshod over the people of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to characterize not just those four that are described here in terms of the beast. It's going to characterize all human governments. So I think there's a sense in which these four empires represent all empires. They represent all human governments. That human government has a way of um, seeking its own agenda. It seeks its own survival. The most important thing for a government is to survive. And if we have to send all our young people into war to survive, well, we're going to survive, right? Yeah, you know, survival. So human governments are not uh, don't have the agenda of the kingdom of God. I think that's part of the point. And the other point is that the kingdom of God is going to be victorious and that the people of God are going to inherit that kingdom. So let's take a look at these four beasts. And as you notice on the handout, um, I do go back to chapter two, where we have the statue, the statue of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then this iron and clay in the feet. And we talked about that some time ago, but I also put it off in terms of, okay, who exactly are we talking about here? Because what we have in chapter 7 is um, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and then the unidentified. And with the unidentified comes 10 kings and then a little horn. A single horn that comes out of the, that displaces three of the 10. And I think these are parallel. I think they're talking about the same thing. Now, what happens to the statue? What do you remember? What happens to the statue? Yeah. Yeah, it's destroyed. What destroys it? God does, but what's the symbol? Yeah, we got this rock that comes from God and strikes it so that it falls. Right? And the kingdom is received. The kingdom of God begins you know, um, in some sense. And what happens here is we have a, a courtroom, a court throne, the Ancient of Days, and ultimately the Ancient of Days comes and destroys the little horn. Right? And the result is the kingdom of God. And over here, of course, the result is the kingdom of God. So it is quite parallel. Yeah. And what view you take of how to identify these kingdoms, what they are, uh, is going to uh, radically shape how you understand what's going on in the chapter. Right. Now, if you notice on the handout, I, I, I offer three views. Right. 
on the handout. There are other views. These are not all of them. These are just the three major ones. And there's all sorts of differences within each, you know, each view, you know, with different representatives can have different nuances to things. And so it's, um, um, it, it can't be nice. I mean, I'd like to make it nice and tidy if I could, but it's, it's, it's a mess, you know, and, but the three views do kind of capture the distinctions, the primary distinctions. The first view, um, let's, let's call it um, the kind of, um, uh, you can call it a preterist view. It's a, it's a fulfilled view. It's already accomplished kind of view. I'm just going to call it number one. <laughs> right. um, it's an already happened kind of view, right? Um, and both one and two have already happened. But here, and this is the one you probably learned growing up with the flannel board, some of us, right? Because we have, this is, no, I'm sorry. This is Babylon. And this is Medo-Persia. And this is Greece, Alexander the Great. Medo-Persia, Cyrus the Great, you know, who liberated Israel from, or Judah from, from the captivity in Babylon and sent them back to the land to rebuild the temple. Right? And then Rome. Now, what the, what, let me give you why that makes some sense and then offers what, what, kind of problems we might have with this, right? Um, it does make sense in that the, these four empires, even Jews in the days of Jesus talked about these four. So this is a very common interpretation, although view number two is also a common one among the Jews, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and the problem comes with... Um, Oh, and by the way, when we get to chapter 8, chapter 8 clearly identifies these two as two of the kingdoms he's talking about, Daniel's talking about. Actually names them. The Medes and Persians and Greeks in chapter 8. Right? So they're, they're specifically named in chapter 8. The question is, um, the ram and the goat in chapter 8. The ram is Medo-Persia. The goat is Greece. Uh, to what does it refer? Does it refer to the silver and the bronze? Or does it refer to something, something else? And that's, that's another story. Now the problem here is that uh, trying to figure out what that clay feet is. What's the clay feet? And what are these ten kings? We're talking about 10 literal kings. We're talking about 10 rulers, 10 kingdoms. We're talking about, do they rule all at the same time or do they rule in succession? And there are different theories about that. But if you're going to take this as the Roman Empire in the past, what does the 10 refer to? And there's no real easy answer to that because there's no real say oh yeah there were 10 divisions in the roman empire or there were 10 provinces in the roman empire i mean that would be too easy you know if it, that were the case but we don't have anything like that so if you're going to take this view the 10 becomes problematic and some people suggest well the 10 is just symbolic number it's not a real number it's not it's a number that says complete you know 10 can be used as a figure of speech like um, Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was in Daniel 1, verse 20. Was it Nebuchadnezzar said, I, I prefer Daniel 10 times over anybody else? No. So 10 can be used kind of that way. But then the other problem is, okay, who's the little horn? What is the little horn? If you're going to take this view, who's the little horn? And someone might say, well, it's one of the emperors of Rome. Maybe it's Nero. Maybe it's Domitian. You yeah. know one of the persecutors of the church. Well, okay. That can make sense. 
But then you have the question, of, well, the kingdom of God comes. The, this kingdom falls, Rome falls, and then the kingdom comes. What, what, what kingdom are we talking about here? Are we talking about the kingdom that is received by Jesus at his ascension? When Jesus ascends with the clouds and goes, approaches the Ancient of Days and, re, and receives the throne and sits down at the right hand of God. Okay. But then what's the judgment? You know, this, this uh, judgment that is coming um, from this judgment here that's coming from the Ancient of Days and a kingdom is received. Is that kind of the Millennial kingdom? Is that the thousand year reign kingdom? Is that which is what some people would want to say? So you have to you have to think about what well, if Rome falls, um, what was the act of judgment in that? When was that? How did the how was the kingdom received after it fell? Are we talking about after it falls that it receives it? Well, there's this kingdom that blows it away, right? So there's all kinds of questions about when and where and what. And it, I think it gets really difficult to discern. But the typical way view, number one, would say it is to say, we had a succession of empires, and in the reign of the Roman Empire, Jesus came, and Jesus died and was raised and he ascended to the right hand of God and he began to reign during the Roman Empire. And it is the reign of Jesus that will subvert the Roman Empire and destroy the Roman Empire. Not by violence, not by the church taking up swords and defeating the Roman Empire, but by the church being the suffering servant following Jesus. By taking up the cross of Jesus and suffering persecution and ultimately eat away at and destroy the Roman Empire. That's that's kind of the typical way that that's understood. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't given the interpretation by God. Yeah, I think that's. He, his his ability to interpret was dependent upon God's gift, right? So if God didn't give him the gift, God gave him the dream. So he might say, "Hey, God, I mean, you gave me the dream. What what's up with that? You know, you, I just got to sit here with this dream. Uh, I need interpretation, yeah, because uh, he knew it was important, and he and he, when he saw the content of it that but the people of God were going to be persecuted and blasphemed and attacked. Well, that, that was, that, that, he wanted to know more about that, right? All right, so let's go to view two. View two, as you see on your handout, says, okay, we got Babylon, but this is the Medes, and this is the Persians, and this is the Greeks. What we'll see from the goat is it comes from the West, right? And it conquers everything, conquers the whole world, right? And one of the problems with saying that this is Rome and that it is past is that it talks about Rome conquering the whole world. But the world that Rome conquered is not the world of Daniel. Daniel lived in Babylon, in Mesopotamia, you know, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, you know, that sort of area of the world. The Roman Empire never got that far. The Roman Empire was stopped by the Empire of Parthia. It never got past Palestine. Never got into what we call Jordan and Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Never, never, never went over there. It got defeated. Roman Empire was defeated repeatedly by the Parthians. And so Rome never conquered the area that Daniel lived in. So that's one of the problems with the Rome scenario. 
um, unless you think that Rome is still future, not past. Right? So if you think it's past, it's a little problem. This one has a lot going for it. One of the problems is, can you really divide out the Medes and Persians? Well, yeah, there was a Median Empire that ruled simultaneous with the Babylonian Empire until, through marriage, Cyrus was born. And so he was not only a Persian, he was a Mede. And so he united the empires, Persia and Mede. And so then you had a, a, a Medo-Persian Empire. But there is a, there's a case to be made that... The Medes was an independent empire, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks. And the Greeks makes a lot of sense out of this. Because um, Alexander the Great conquered all the way to India, right? From Greece to India, which would be the whole world as far as Daniel was concerned. Right? Can't get much beyond that. And when he died, it was divided into four groups, into four territories. We'll talk more about this next week in chapter 8. Then, one of those territories, which was Syria, was ruled by the Seleucids, the family called Seleucid. And they had a series of kings. Some debate about the number 10, and that would be one of the problems with this picture that I'm drawing here. But the, the point would be that we have 10 kings. And if you take that as a symbolic number, then it's not a problem. It's just we're going to have a series of kings. But then there's going to be one king who stands out as the persecutor of God's people. Uh, and does look at what it says about the little horn, right? In verse 25, he will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. This is where it gets you know, very controversial. Um, some would argue that verse 25 is talking about this king who is called Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And Antiochus Epiphanes reigned from like, like I'm not going to get these dates right, I don't think, like 175 to 163, something like that. But right before he died, he did something for the three years before he died. He went into Jerusalem and he stopped the sacrifices. And he put up an altar to Zeus. Okay, he's got the Greek influence, right? Because he's one of the he's from the family of the Greeks who took over this region. But he put up an altar to Zeus in the temple of God and sacrificed a pig on it. And he stopped the temple from its daily sacrifices. And he persecuted the people of God, assassinated the high priest. Um, and it was, um, you know, this is where Hanukkah comes from, right? Hanukkah is when they, when they liberated themselves from the Seleucids through the Maccabean revolt. They wanted to rededicate the temple but they didn't have enough oil to light the lamps. Yeah, right. So they, huh? Yeah, they do. They show, they show something of that. Um, so you, they light the, you know, the lamps, but they don't have enough oil. But miraculously, there was always enough oil. Kind of like in the Elijah story, you know, with the widow, always going to have enough bread and oil. Uh, that, and that's where Hanukkah comes from. So this was a real event. It's a historical event. It's written about in a lot of places in the ancient world. Um, and some suggest, well, that's who we're talking about here. The Antiochus Epiphanes is the little king. Now, the problem, though, is in what sense did the kingdom of God come in that moment? 
you could say, yeah, that king got judged. He, he died. And the nation was liberated. And the Maccabeans began to rule independently. It was the first independent rule by, by Israel or the Judeans uh, since the time of the exile. They were liberated from any imperial power. And some would say, well, that's partly what that kingdom is about. Um, but it's a problem because, uh, you know, it's not a, um, there's no messianic picture here about Jesus or the rock or the son of man. You know, it's, it's hard to picture that here. The third view is like the first view, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But the distinction is because we're waiting for the kingdom of God, And that kingdom is the kingdom that Jesus will establish when he comes the second time, as it's understood in this view. We're missing something here. Because Rome doesn't exist anymore. The empire of Rome is gone. So how is Jesus going to return and judge the empire of Rome when it doesn't exist anymore? Well, and that's where this view says, well, that's why we have kind of, a, there's several ways of doing this. One is, well, there's a lineage in history, you know, like the Holy Roman Empire and, you know, so on. There's kind of, you can piece together kind of this lineage through history. Or others would say, well, there's kind of a parenthesis here. There's an interlude. And that Rome will be reestablished at some point, that the Empire of Rome will come back um, and we'll have ten kings and then a little horn who is the Antichrist will arise from that final Roman Empire, Roman Kingdom. Um, and there's a lot of make connections with Revelation. 13 and 17, about the ten-horned beast there. Because we have a ten-horned beast here, and we have a little horn, and we have a little horn in Revelation, or a horn that grows up. Um, and if you understand Revelation as something that's still future, so that's how they're going to make the case. It gets complicated. It's, it's just not right on the surface here. Um, so when we're talking about who is the little horn, well, in this view, it's probably one of the Roman emperors. And this is gone and done, right? It's happened. The kingdom of God has come. Jesus reigns at the right hand of God. And we're waiting for Jesus to return to finish the job on all the other human governments, <laughs> right? On all the other empires that come and go. And that the point would be that this series is not the only series you're going to have. That human governments will rise and fall. Empires will come and go. And it will happen over and over and over again. But, at the, end, but the Rome thing, um, the Roman Empire, is going to be the one in which the kingdom of God arrives in the person of Jesus and he's exalted to the right hand of God and receives the kingdom from the Father from the Ancient of Days and now reigns there. And we reign with him uh, even now. We, we are reigning with Christ even now. But we're waiting for Christ to return to um, give the final blow to evil and the empires. Right? That's view number one. View number two, Little Horn, is Antiochus Epiphanes, who we'll talk more about next week. And that that happened, and it's done, it's over. What, 
what the beast, the statue and the beast, what that's describing has already happened. And um, the kingdom of God has come in the sense that this is what God does all the time. That is, God is always judging empires. God doesn't just let empires run amok and then come to a point and say, well, after those four, I think we'll just be done with this. <laughs> All right. Is that God is always engaged in judging empires. Um, and so what we have here is one snapshot of what is the continuous cycle of the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of evil kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. And that this is just one picture that applied to Daniel and, and, and the people of Israel. But that picture is not um, kind of something past and has no meaning for the rest of history. It's rather, it's something past and is an illustration of what is always going on in history. Does that make sense? Yeah. But what Daniel sees is this. He doesn't see the whole. He just sees this, right? This picture. When you come to view three, um, all this is in the future. Now, Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greece and Rome, they're, they're all destroyed. But there is some sense in which the vestiges of Rome continue. And that at some point, we're going to get a renewal of the Roman Empire. And in this renewal of the Roman Empire, we're going to have a global government. Because it's going to spread throughout the whole world. Right? That's what Daniel talks about, the whole world. Chapter, yeah, yeah, here. Um, so we're going to have a global empire. Which is one of the reasons why we have uh, such, um, what's a good way of saying this? We have, in, we have in the evangelical world kind of a consternation, an anxiety about any kind of globalism. You start talking about globalism, and then there, those who believe in this kind of picture, where there's going to be a global empire, and you start talking about globalism, they're hearing Antichrist. That's what they hear when they hear globalism. They hear Antichrist. Now, you might not like globalism for other reasons, but the, the theological interest here is that they're, um, they think the global government, that global empire, is the precursor to the little horn. Because that global empire is going to have ten kings maybe 10 divisions uh, in the late great planet Earth, if I remember right. No, that's not right. Somewhere, huh? Well, Left Behind series has that kind of thing too about the global government and, and then the tribulation and where's the tribulation fit in and the rapture. We're going to get to that in chapter 9 of Daniel. There, there's a way of reading chapter 9 that plays into this scenario. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, that's part of what what um, what advocates are trying to do, trying to explain some of that. So, one of the things that uh, when you remember when there were ten European countries in the European Commonwealth, there were ten of them. I mean, you could just find it easily as walking out your door, somebody saying, "Oh." That's the ten kings. That's the ten countries that are going to have that are going to be the global government, and the antichrist is going to come out of that. You know? And you know, throughout history, there have been other people who who identified other things. Uh, but the point is, whatever that global government looks like, it's identified with these ten kings, and then somewhere along the way. There's going to be a ruler 
who is going to exert power, displace three of those kings and put his put the other kings under his foot, and he's going to be the sole ruler as the Antichrist, the little horn. So when you hear the discussion about the little horn of Daniel and the, uh, the dictator, tyrant, the one who speaks blasphemy against God, the one who wants to change the laws of God, which is what we have here, right? Going to change their sacred festivals and laws. He's going to be against their morality. He's going to be against their uh, religious festivals. Y'all remember not too long ago, people got all upset with Obama because they thought he was anti-Christmas or something? Now, we don't say Merry Christmas anymore. We say Happy, happy Holidays. Well, some people thought, oh, we need to say Merry Christmas because Happy Holidays is just giving in to the global government that wants to change our laws, you know, wants to change our festivals, wants to change. We don't want to call it Christmas anymore and take Christ out of it. We want to call it Happy Holidays. Well, that was part of that, that fervor, right? It's part of the fervor. So you can see how if you, if you believe this scenario, if you think this is the way it's going to happen, you are being asked to pay attention and watch for those 10 kings or those 10 countries and to be prepared for the rise of the Antichrist and for the little horn. And so it, it, it seems to me it becomes kind of, um, this is probably not a good word to use. Um, it can become an unhealthy hysteria. <laughs> To, to kind of, oh, is that it? Oh, is that it? Oh, no, is that it? No. Is this war in Gaza? Is that it? Is that part of it? Is, you know, and so we start trying to figure all this out when all we got to work with is this, basically. And, and a few passages in Revelation and the man of lawlessness in First Thess- Second Thessalonians 2. I mean, there, I mean, there were some other texts that come into play. But we don't have a lot of details. And this view is is um, I think it's problematic because there's no interlude here. This Rome is destroyed, right? It's destroyed. And so if it's destroyed when Jesus comes in the second coming to establish his thousand-year reign, that means Rome still exists. There's a sense in which Rome still exists. And that's a pretty good stretch in my mind. You know, I don't, I don't think Rome still exists. Do empires still exist? Yeah. Do human governments with their agendas still exist? For sure. Are they in conflict with the kingdom of God? Absolutely. All right. So I'm, I'm more inclined. And again, I don't know. You know, I'm, I can't tell you this is it. You know, if you if you had a gun to my head and said you got to choose one or else, you know, then I might choose. <laughs> um, and I think I would go with number two. I think, but I still have some discomfort with number two as well, because. Uh, what is the coming of the Son of Man when you're thinking about number two? When does that happen? What is that? And that leans me more over to number one or some version of number one. I really can't. Now, the, the, point, the point about number three is that the vision seems to indicate that... Um, that this kingdom is going to come in its fullness when God judges this fourth beast. And so the question then uh, is, whoa, wait a minute. It doesn't look like God's judged all the governments yet, does it? Living here. Governments are still around. They're still doing harm. Still in warring with one another. In what sense has the kingdom come? 
Well, I would suggest it's come in the sense that Jesus has been enthroned and that we have been raised to sit with him in heavenly places and that we reign with Christ. And we are waiting for the coming of God in Christ to, to fully establish the kingdom. But over here, it's... Um, there's a sense in which Jesus is already reigning, for sure, but they would want to say that Daniel 7 is talking about the moment when Jesus returns the second time. So it goes back to that question in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. He's coming on the clouds. Yeah, which coming are you talking about? Is he coming up into the throne room to receive the kingdom and sit at the right hand of God? Or is he coming in judgment at the end of time? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, now, when we get to chapter 8, I think we can be more sure about some things. It's okay. It's okay not to be sure, right? Yeah. Because the principle is still in play. See? See, God still reigns, and the, the human governments are in conflict with the kingdom of God. And there will come a time when the kingdom of God will be fully received by the saints. And the persecution of the saints will be ended, and that they will fully enjoy the reign of God. Right. Now, when you look at the book of Revelation, what you have is you have, you have Christ the King reigning, He's sitting on a throne in Revelation. But the saints are still being persecuted. So you still you have that picture. Jesus is on the throne, but saints are being persecuted. And the persecuted saints are crying out, how long? How long will you until you avenge us? You know? And so the picture of Jesus reigning, but saints still being persecuted is, is a legitimate picture. Uh, and the fact that when Jesus comes again, he will um, deal with the persecutors and with the kingdoms that, that are anti-kingdom um, of God. So it's going to be, it's both are true. It's true that Jesus has ascended to the right hand, and it's true that he's going to come again and put an end to evil. Right? The debate is this little horn and the scenario. What is the scenario that is going to happen at the end of time? What's the scenario that's going to happen that we will be able to see and we will see the signs of this ten kings organizing a global government and then we'll see the sign of the little horn rising out of the, out of the ten to take control of the whole global government. And we will then be able to identify him as the Antichrist. And so the point that people who emphasize number three is the, they, they, want to, they want to prepare us for that moment so that we're not surprised by it, that we also can be assured that God is still with us, you know, God is still going to act for our sake, so there's some good motives here for that understanding. Um, I just, I think of the three views, number three is the bottom one for me of the three views. But I got a lot of friends who think number three is it. You know, I got a lot of friends who believe that. And I said, okay, you can believe that. I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to send you to hell or anything. You know, just just remember that every time you identify the Antichrist, whether it was Napoleon or Bismarck or Hitler or Trump or whoever, you know, just remember you were wrong, <laughs> you know, and, and that there's another one coming. You know, there's always going to be another one. In other words, there's some uncertainty here. Um, in in how this plays out. But I think the point that that um, 
I think a healthy point, a healthy motive in this is given what they understand this to mean, they want to prepare the people of God for the trauma that is coming. There's, there's trauma coming. There's tribulation coming. And so we need to be prepared for it. God has warned us about it in, in this prophecy, right? So God has warned us so we can be prepared. I, I just don't think that the warning is what they think it is, you know, at least. But, I, but again, I'm not certain about that. Yeah. Something else I'm about going through is so much. God's world, world has never seen it. Mm -hmm. We go through hard times all the time. Yeah. God's world still like that. Yeah, there's 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 tribulation all the time, and God is with us. You're right, Bob. Right, Pete. I want to call you Bobby because that's how I see you on Facebook. But you know, I don't know you're Pete. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what you. That's your Facebook name. You know, the Facebook name, First John. You know, um, but yeah, there's always tribulation and there's always assurance. God's with us. The question is, is there going to be this great tribulation, this extreme trauma, this climactic trauma that is going to shake the world to its roots in a seven-year tribulation that the little horn is going to lead and persecute the people of God in, in, in ways that we can't even imagine? And that's what they want to, that's what these preachers, those who, who take this view in all sincerity, you know, a, a very sincere, very, uh, they're trying to understand what the Bible says. <clears throat> and their motive is, we just want to prepare the people of God for what's coming. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to Daniel 9, particularly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we will... Next week, we'll be in chapter 8. And then we're going to spend two weeks in chapter 9. Because this uh, chapter 7 and chapter 9 are kind of really the, the highlight reels you know, of, uh, of current discussion about what the end times might look like. And we'll see that. And uh, Oh, by the way, Remember that the little horn is going to reign. He's going to have this traumatic persecution of the people of God three and a half times, right? Many take that to mean three and a half years. Or it could just mean a brief period. Um, but if you take it as three and a half years, that's when you, you start talking about tribulation. There's a seven-year tribulation. And there's three and a half years in which things go well. And there's three and a half years in which the little horn takes over you know um and at some point christians are raptured in that at least some believe that not everybody believes that um and then they can't agree whether are they raptured before the seven years are they raptured after the seven years are they raptured in the middle of the seven years so that they don't go through the bad stuff i mean there are whole books written on that question you know um and uh, there's a there's part of me that says, ah, you know, I don't think we can know all that much about that. Yeah. I think what we can know is, yeah, the kingdoms of this world have their own agenda. And they're going to create their own turmoil. But the kingdom of God will ultimately reign. And we will be invited into that reign with God. And the kingdom of God will rule the nations. Not all the nations are going to be destroyed. There, there are nations in Revelation 22. The nations are there. So some nations are going to be redeemed. But that's another story. I, I'm gone too long. Thank you for your attention. I, it was, wasn't as much participation tonight. I didn't give you that chance uh, because I was trying to explain this best I could. And I hope, it's, uh, I hope it has some clarity to you. Um, but... Uh, if it doesn't, it's because I'm not clear either. <laughs> okay.
So I just confess that up front, right? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Hey, John.